and if you're willing to do that, if you would stand, please, and repeat after me. I do hereby affirm that I will tell the truth and nothing but the truth to this committee today. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to say to all of the people that have testified, you have done an incredible job. When I was asked to do this, I debated for a while, and it's a subject literally I know very little about, except what I read in the newspaper most of it years ago. Um, I was a skeptic when I came, and what I have found, and this has to do with the credibility of the people that have testified, I want you to know that, that I don't know what it is or how big it is, but I do believe that we have, um, that there are spaceships, whether they're friendly or whether they're enemies, we have, that they have been enough sightings of a human creature. I don't know what it looks like. And so I appreciate what you have, the sacrifices you've made and what you've done. And for those of you here testifying for family members, or this is the first time that you've talked in public about this issue, you are to be commended. I know it has to be a difficult thing. And it's easy for me because I just got to sit here and listen to all of you. Uh, and so I just appreciate all of you that have been here and what you have done. And uh, it was a privilege to sit and listen to your testimony. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Hooley. We'll now uh, start with our witnesses. And I think we're allowing 10 minutes each. That's great. If I could ask, okay. uh, Dr. Wood, would you begin? Thank you. It's an honor to be included as a witness. In 1966, I had been working about 13 years for one company and was doing well as a young engineering executive at Douglas Aircraft. That was the year the Air Force decided to have a symposium dedicated to important developments in space 10 years hence. And my boss, Ray Hallett, had been selected to speak for our missiles and space part of the company on how to better to get things to orbit and back. He asked, what do you think we should talk about? And I said, partly as a jest, why don't we just tell them how the alleged UFOs do it? He actually liked the idea and asked me to work on it. That was when I read my first UFO book, actually one by Don Menzel, the science arch skeptic, and I saw clearly that he was ignoring the reported data. I immediately read a dozen books on the subject. A year later, Douglas had been bought by McDonnell, and we were now McDonnell Douglas, and had just won the Air Force satellite program called Manned Orbiting Laboratory. My regular job was to manage our company research and development projects funds so that we would win small technology contracts. One day, after I reported to a couple of VPs on how we were doing, one of them asked me personally if I was doing anything interesting outside my job. And I said, well, you're not going to believe this, but I've read about 50 books on UFOs. And the amazing conclusion I've come to is that they are very real extraterrestrial craft, and the only thing that's uncertain is to whether we find out how they work before or after our competitor Lockheed. <laughs> after a moment of silence, one of them said, how much would it cost to take a look at that question? Therefore, we started a little project, kept quite low key to study the question of how they work. Everyone who worked on this project knew that when the project was over, each would go back to his other job, or be laid off. This was when we needed to find someone to study the sightings and reports in detail to see if we could get clues as to how they worked. And we hired Stan Friedman. We should have a picture of Stan Friedman up there right now, as he looked in 1968. 
We did a lot of interesting projects, such as measure the effects of a huge magnetic field on the speed of light. There was none. Interview an abductee. Try to invent a physics that would permit travel faster than the speed of light. Developed an instrumented van to observe craft sightings anywhere, anytime, and spun magnets in space to try to change their weight. It didn't change. I also became friends with James E. MacDonald, a physicist who was making a lot of noise and giving lectures about the details of highly credible sightings. Jim MacDonald was very pushy to have my group get more exposure. He urged me to visit the Air Force UFO Condon Committee in 1967 before their report was complete and talked someone into inviting me to testify at a House Science and Astronautics Committee Symposium on Unidentified Flying Objects. I asked my management about this and they said, do what you want, but good things rarely happen to people who testify to Congress. <laughs> I decided not to testify, largely since I did not have any breakthroughs to even hint at. And if I did, they would have been the property of McDonnell Douglas. Then the military orbiting program was canceled in 1969. Dozens of people were being laid off. We were not making fantastic project, progress on our project. And I was assigned in 1970 to learn everything I could about radar and ballistic missile defense. We canceled the UFO project and moved on. This project's history was written up in both the International UFO Reporter in 1993, detailing the results of my visit to the Condon Committee, and the MUFON Journal in 2008, elaborating on the details of who did what on this project and what we concluded. I followed the topic of, uh, of ufology from 1970 to my retirement in 1993 as an avocation, but remained actively absorbing results and reports from MUFON the Center for UFO Studies, and subscribe to the Flying Saucer Review, which came in a brown paper envelope, so you wouldn't know the subject, published in Britain. The consistency of alien reports occurring psychically caused me to be aware of other anomalous literature, and I had the pleasure of meeting Dean Bob John of Princeton University, who was initiating a consciousness research project. At the same time, my knowledge of radar put me in a position to manage a classified program with top secret access to various subjects. I had read an article by Dr. Hal Putoff, currently then at Stanford Research Institute, reporting on some amazing results in remote viewing. We used our CIA contacts to work out a test project on coordinate remote viewing, where the subject is allegedly able to observe and describe what is at a specific Earth coordinate. This sensitive remote viewing project wound up being funded by James S. McDonald, CEO of McDonnell Douglas, who was subsequently told by his lawyers that he should not have used foundation money to accomplish work in his profit-making firm. <laughs> the results of one test of six targets were interesting but not spectacular. We speculated that the viewer might have gone to a coordinate in time when the most emotional events were happening at that location. This project also provided access to anything to do with ballistic missile defense. And I used a nice classified library at another facility to see what there was on the defense against UFOs. There were quite a few intriguing reports available, such as a classified version of the Iranian Air Force F-4 Phantom jet pilot attempting to fire a missile at a UFO only to have his controls shut down as soon as he thought about doing it. Then, after I had borrowed and read quite a few of these anomalous reports, the whole library system was changed so that it was no longer clear where to look for reports. I also stayed aware of anomalies in science in general. And when the so-called cold fusion results of Pons Fleischmann were announced in 1989, I was aware that our company attempted a quick covert test to try to replicate the results. I was told we were not successful, but by then I was working on advanced technology for NASA International Space Station and not involved in any proprietary activity. After retirement in 1993, my focus on UFOs became the authentication of leaked documents as described on Wednesday. If these documents are valid, they are consistent in the telling the story of exposure to the alien technology, attempts to understand it, 
and many specific tales of successfully understanding the principles and building devices that have become the technology breakthroughs we all enjoy today. There is a case to be made that the three crash recoveries of Missouri in April 1941 and LA in February 1942, 1,430 rounds of ammunition during the famous LA air raid, resulted in a specific contract to study how germanium and silicon might be used in the preparation of semiconductors. Those individuals receiving reports and samples included Edward Condon at Westinghouse, Bell Laboratories, Hans Beta of MIT Radi Radiation Laboratory, and Shockley of Bell Telephone Laboratories in 1945, who was given credit for inventing the transistor in 1947. These leaked documents taken as a whole visualize and speculate on the impact of alien technology on our society in a diverse array of fields of science and technology. And doctor, you've got about one minute left on your time. Thank you. All right, then I'll ignore mentioning Philip Corso's uh, comments. So what of my opinion of what's required to understand how they work and to build one? The simple answer is I don't know. But beyond that, I could say I would look for the following four things. First, a way to cross the light years to stars without actually physically speeding past and through the space and space debris that separates us. Second, a way to interact with time in a reliable fashion through the equivalent of the so-called wormhole so that journeys would take years, wind up taking minutes. Third, a way to permit a person's mind to interact with matter so reliably that all you have to do is think clearly and equipment does what you want it to if it's designed right. Finally, to expect that the breakthroughs will come from unknown scientists, probably pretty young, who are looking outside the establishment's perspective of the solution. I leave you with this thought, that Arthur Clarke's famous quote is highly applicable. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think that the millions of years that may separate us from the alien civilizations are not significant because logic does not change with time. I expect that the laws of physics, which we have yet to understand, will be the same, and so will the equations. We just have to find them. Does some black program already have this knowledge? Thank you, Dr. Wood. Sweet. Uh, could we, let's see, could we now uh, have uh, Dr. Uh, Greer uh, take 10 minutes? Thank you very much. I appreciate being here again. Uh, I would like to open with sort of a historical overview of advanced technologies that began in the late 1800s uh, with the breakthroughs with Maxwell and also Faraday. It turns out that the Maxwell equations that were developed had a number of changes that resulted in what is now classic electromagnetic theory. Uh, this has resulted in a number of errors uh, in the equations, which are, have been corrected by people who have looked at them very carefully. Between the late 1800s and 1929, there were a number of breakthroughs that ended up uh, being suppressed that had to do with creating very high voltage VHV systems so that you could create a vector into what's now been called the zero point energy field. And I refer the panel to the uh, Jane's Defense Weekly writer, uh, Nick uh, Cook, and his book, uh, The Hunt for Zero Point. Uh, this uh, began to be uh, explored by people like Nikola Tesla and others. I have a Department of Defense uh, document that has, is on a flash drive for each member of Congress that the conference has been given the citizens' hearings has been given, that shows that when Nikola Tesla died, that this information that he had, uh, which allowed for a car to run out of the ambient energy, uh, was uh, in documents confiscated by the FBI. And I have a doc Department of Defense document demanding that the FBI turn these over to the DOD. The FBI refused. At any rate, science continues because the laws of the universe are in fact universal and they can be discovered here or around Alpha Centauri or any place else in the cosmos. By 1928 and 29, T. Townsend Brown, as well as the Kolosky-Frost experiment in physics in Germany, 
had determined that VHV, very high voltage systems, done in a certain resonant field could result in so-called electromagnetogravitic effect, the lifter effect that has been described, which you see in UFOs. They also can create what's called a space-time bubble around an object so that you can correct for 1G. This is how these objects are traveling at multiples of what any aerodynamic uh, physics would describe and can make right-hand turns without killing the occupants. Around this same time, there was in the 1940s and the late 1930s a number of UFO sightings. This included the so-called Foo Fighters. Yes, it's a famous rock group. However, the Foo Fighters took their name from the reports of these objects seen in the theater of World War II that were flying around our aircraft. We thought it was a secret weapon of the Nazis. The Nazis thought it was a secret weapon of ours. Uh, there is Jimmy Doolittle, the famous general. His nephew is a dear friend of mine, and he has testified that General Doolittle was sent by FDR over to the European theater in World War II, investigated the Foo Fighters, and came back and told Roosevelt, and I quote, they are interplanetary vehicles. So by then, there began a classified program, uh, and which was augmented further by events, as mentioned, in 1941, and then, of course, the famous Roswell event. Those events led to, as Philip Corso describes, a reverse engineering program. As you all know from the famous Wilbur Smith document of 1951 from Canada, it talks about that flying saucers exist, but there's a high-level team headed up by Dr. Vannevar Bush that is studying the, quote, motus operandi of these vehicles. These were the most brilliant scientists, Edward Teller, Oppenheimer, and others, Herman Oberth, amongst others, who were in this team studying how uh, extraterrestrial vehicles move. In October of 1954, a key date I want the committee to remember, we have actionable intelligence from someone who has worked in the National Security Agency and has been in the vault. All of this went deep black because they figured out, at that point, gravity control. So since 1954, October of that year, we have not needed rockets, jets, internal combustion engines, and surface roadways between cities. I say this with authority that this is the case. Eventually, these breakthroughs in human discovery were complemented by the study of the extraterrestrial materiel that were retrieved from these events. And contrary to most people's thoughts, the Roswell event was actually a, a downing of an extraterrestrial vehicle by an electromagnetic system that was hidden in a radar dome that was switched on. And this is in an FBI document that I can provide for the committee and is on the flash drive given to the Congress. Uh, the result ultimately was that there were transdimensional physics that began to be studied that deal with the nexus between electromagnetism, energy generation, anti-gravity, and consciousness. And we have discovered that there is a nexus and that, in fact, there are electromagnetic systems that have been developed that can interface directly with what we call coherent thought, the same way that you can interface with uh, a system with lasers, which is coherent light, where you sync up all the wavelengths. Ultimately, this, uh, these breakthroughs were paralleled with uh, amazing developments in the biological sciences uh, and the experimentation with cloning. And this began many years earlier than was reported from Dolly uh, the sheep in Scotland. This goes a little beyond, I think, what this committee wants to look into. However, you need to understand that the technologies that we have and we are discussing are not theoretical. We have actionable intelligence that any committee in Congress or executive action can find regarding current operations. And I just want to go through a list of them very quickly of these facilities and corporations for which we have witnesses who uh, can be subpoenaed by the committees of the Congress. Uh, this was developed at the request of Congressman Christopher Cox of Orange County, and, with whom I met, and was later de further developed for uh, the briefing for, that we put together for President Obama. These facilities are the Edwards Air Force Base and subsections where 
uh, on at the uh, dry lake bed where the Lockheed uh, Skunk Works operations, Haystack Butte, China Lakes, George Air Force Base, and the closed Norton Air Force Base where an anti-gravity device, so-called alien reproduction vehicle, for which we have the schematics was seen by Frank Carlucci and others on our witness team. Uh, tabletop Mountain and Blackjack Control. Uh, the aerospace facilities there are the Northrop Anthill Facility, Tihon Ranch, the McDonnell Douglas Lano Plant, Lockheed Martin Hellendale Plant, and the Phillips Lab. At the Nellis Air Force Facility, so-called Area 51, no one calls it that. There's S-4 and S-12, Pahoot Mesa, Groom Lake, and a num number of sub-facilities. The most important facility is in Utah, near Provo, the Dugway Proving Grounds, all of which is underground and the airspace above it is classified. There are no roads into this facility. The New Mexico facilities include Los Alamos National Labs with underground connectors to the so-called Dulce area where the biological work is being done and Kirtland Air Force Base. And the complex there includes Sandia National Laboratories, Phillips Labs, Mansano Met Mountain Weapon Storage Facility, Coyote Canyon, and the White Sands Complex. In Arizona, near Fort Huachuca, which is Army Intelligence Headquarters, there is a UGB underground base where one of our witnesses, who will testify, worked on nine separate extraterrestrial vehicles that had been down through advanced electromagnetic pulse weapons, and there are several different species of extraterrestrial biologicals stored at that facility. The other facilities, and this goes on, uh, include the sh uh, a special compartmented area of Cheyenne Mountain where we have witnesses in our team who can be subpoenaed uh, where that we have tracked extraterrestrial vehicles in our solar system that we're measuring 26 miles in diameter. Uh, there are also uh, facilities in Australia, a key one being Pine Gap, the so-called Alice Springs facility, which is mostly a U.S. Air Force facility even though it is in Australia. Um, I recently talked to the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia about this. Uh, also the Redstone Arsenal and the Marshall Space Flight Center. We have a scientist at the Redstone Arsenal under, who works under contract for IT&T who have developed these transdimensional systems. He was under contract with my project to bring these energy devices out and he was then threatened by a former CIA director and what I call the goon squad that went down there three years ago in March. This is just part of the information we have, and this information is on the flash drive given then that you're all welcome to review. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> well done and well timed because that sign came up just about three seconds after you ended. Uh, Dr. Vallone, 10 minutes. I'd like to start with my slides and show them exclusively as I go through them. Uh, what I'm about to say is uh, my own personal viewpoint does not relate in any way to the federal government. Nothing I'm stating is uh, reflecting government policy and they're my original thoughts as a private citizen. Uh, next slide. This is a presentation of what I'm familiar with and uh, my journey began in 1980 with the uh, book called Sunburst Return of the Ancients by Norman Paulson. And the book was fascinating in the fact that there were a lot of very anomalous UFO uh, uh, details uh, shown. This particular side-by-side -side photo and uh, the person who took the photo was a deputy sheriff holding the instamatic photo taken in broad daylight over giant rock. This is fascinating because none of this has happened since then and Van Tassel, George Van Tassel was responsible for holding UFO conferences uh, through the 50s and through the 60s. I even talked to Dr. Bob Beck who witnessed one of these craft and as you can see there's some type of force uh, illumination below the craft as well. So I went out to the community and uh, found what they were working on was a homopolar generator. Uh, next slide. The uh, interesting part of the book described the uh, propulsion system as being 12 magnets around the outer edge of a very large disk, size of the ship, carrying off electrical current. Two disks in opposite direction provided the gravity force, whatever propulsion system they had. So this particular passage I reprinted in my homopolar handbook, next slide. 
and also convinced my professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo to let me work on it as a physics project for my master's degree in physics. And I was very pleased to actually build a homopolar generator, test it for back torque, and unfortunately I measured back torque, which means it slows down as you draw current from it. So the mystery continued. Um, next slide. I basically found that uh, Dr. Ed Mitchell, as you see here on the cover of Extraordinary Science magazine, was also interested in the same topic. Uh, Bruce De Palma was the source of the interest, and he was building homopolar generators like crazy, uh, looking for investors one after another, which he succeeded in doing. However, uh, Ed held on to his money, which is in his breast pocket there, and um, what was interesting about this particular cover that came out years later was that the Searle disc is also shown on the same magazine cover next to the homopolar. So I thought this was sort of a coincidence or synchronicity, and I ended up investigating the Searle disc. Next slide. And I met John Searle in 1980 in Germany, and uh, he actually became kind of a, a curiosity to me. Even today, he still is. He's still a living legend. Uh, he claimed to have uh, these discs, as you can see here, uh, hovering, and he had a UFO experience when he was young, and then he started building these things. So, uh, next slide. I uh, basically tried to help him, connected with different people. He uh, essentially became a little more well-known when he gave a talk in Berlin in 1990, and then some Russians discovered him because of that lecture in the video and decided to build what they described as a single uh, roller magnet assembly with 12 ro roller magnets around the outer edge of a ring. And so I started to think twice, of, hey, this may be something related to what was called the Moo Disc back in the Paulson book. And that's one of the biographies you can get off the shelf, Anti Gravity, The Dream Made Reality by John Thomas. Next slide. So the, the short, long story short is that these roller magnets are individual homopolar generators, and they definitely seem to lend itself to voltage generation if the whole ring could somehow be propelled. And that's the magic and the mystery behind the whole thing. Well, the Russians had a whole grocery list, as you can see on the right, of all these anomalies that they supposedly measured. And so what I ended up doing, next slide, was to connect them to an investor, um, which I constantly do throughout these years, find an investor for the strange inventors, put them together. In this case, we went to the Department of Energy. The contact was very friendly to us, offered a Russian translator for us. We did due diligence for the whole day. And the investor was comfortable to throw his money at the Russian gold and roast in inventions. And the outcome was, next slide, <clears throat> the big prototype at cost of a lot of uh, money, to, uh, which was built and completed in Moscow. And then it was retrofitted and completed again and again, and even to this day, it doesn't quite do what it's supposed to do, but it certainly looks interesting. Uh, next slide. So the, back to the George Van Tassel story, um, since this is dealing with implications of extraterrestrial technology, uh, George's story is that he had lots of UFO experiences, even rides on craft and so forth. And his, um, um, would you say his download or his uh, conclusion from all of these experiences uh, was, hey, I'm going to build a healing chamber, a rejuvenation chamber uh, called the Integratron. And it's right near Giant Rock. I've actually gone out there. Next slide. And it still is in existence today, Integratron.com. And it's all wood construction with no nails. Next slide. And it's very fascinating because it has these unusual die rods. The whole assembly of die rods was supposed to rotate. And it also has a primary and secondary coil inside that looks like an inverted Tesla coil. So you get the impression that it would draw atmospheric ad electricity, since it's very dry there, it's feasible this would work, and then charge up the inside with some uh, of this energy. Next slide. So that concludes the possible rejuvenation implications of ET contact. Um, and what I'd like to conclude with is the zero-point energy inertial shielding and electrogravitics. Next slide. First of all, zero-point energy is very famous. I wrote a book on it. I wrote two books, actually. And it's been confirmed consistently even up to last week, where our future energy news announced some new polymer um, pyrrole that actually can't be explained unless two-thirds of it is due to zero-point energy. Next slide. 
And here we have the reason why zero-point energy may be important, and we'll see if she can insert the 30-second video that's supposed to actually start. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're going to get a video or not. But, oh, maybe. Okay. Yes. Okay, this is an example of many. You've probably seen some of these already. The, the, the craft is spinning. It's up close. It looks like a legitimate... Uh, authentic video, uh, amateur video, and right about now you're going to see a very fast acceleration. And that's what we've been talking about, folks. And the important part is that uh, this introduces a concept which I'd like to share with the panel, and that is uh, inertia is involved. And, and as we get to the next slide, hopefully we can see that. The um, uh, inertial mass and gravitational mass are totally different. I repeat myself, inertial mass and gravitational mass have nothing to do with each other. Einstein made a mistake years ago and called it the equivalence principle. Uh, I studied it even in grad school. I took relativity and I took general relativity. And so it's a fascinating to me that it's sort of overlooked. Uh, slide right after this. And the important part is that nowadays, inertia has been discovered to be a zero-point field Lorentz force by Heche, Weta, and Putoff. This is a seminal paper that's so important that it opens the door to actually controlling inertia and understanding how any ET craft or UFOs could possibly have fast acceleration, right angle turns, and maybe even travel through the universe. It turns out F equals V cross B, a simple Lorentz force at the bottom of the um, slide there showing how it works. So when we go around a curve and you feel that force moving you in the opposite direction, it's an electromagnetic interaction. Next slide. And this applies to relativity. I, I heard one of the gentlemen on the panels uh, questioning uh, special relativity. Well, that's inertial mass. That is the M in relativistic increase in mass as you go toward the speed of light. If you can shield inertial mass, miracles happen. And this is another demonstration. I showed this slide to the deputy director of the NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, in case you don't know what NRO stands for. And this was very important because, as you see, F equals MA, Newton's law, can be modified. If, if M can be shielded and it lowers, then A could increase for the same amount of force. Next slide. Oh, and by the way, the uh, NRO uh, deputy director said, well, things like this tend to become more and more classified until they're out of sight. He says it's easier for us to reinvent it for a private contractor. And I said, you mean the taxpayers have to pay double for something like this? And he said, yes. <laughs> So um, here's another proof of inertial shielding, and that is the right angle turn that's photographed here with open shutter, 35 millimeter on tripod, 2 a.m. outside Stewart Air Force Base. The triangle craft started from the upper part, and the shutter was open, made a tremendous right turn, then continued as if nothing happened. Red and green lights make it look like it's conventional. Next slide. And Dr. Vallone, <clears throat> you've got about one minute. I understand. I see. And now the conclusion is electrokinetic equation helps explain how we can combine electrokinetics or electrogravitics and inertial shielding. Uh, pulsed current will produce a force. Next slide. And I wrote a book on the electrogravitics effect that's even present in the B-2 bomber, thanks to Paula Violet's work and research, and originally starting with Tom's and Brown's research. Next slide. And the conclusion is, and I have to give thanks to Mark McCandlish, who gave a testimony at Dr. Greer's 2001 Disclosure Project in DC, since we know once in a while such electrokinetic powered craft are put on display, as this one was in 1988 in Norton Air Force Base, which is also uh, his entire testimony is reproduced thanks to Mark um, in my book, Electrovitics II. And this was also uh, verified and investigated by Dr. Hal Putoff, and I talked to him personally about this story of Norton Air Force Base showing three hovercraft, and he did his due diligence with it, and he says he put it in his gray box of possible events. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, now be going to Roger Lear. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, before I begin, could you uh, tell us what DDPM uh, stands for? A doctor of podiatric medicine. Okay, thank you. Thank you I uh, want to thank uh, the, the uh, chair of the committee, uh, Mr. Cook. Uh, honorable members of the committee, uh, congressional members, 
uh, uh, my fellow colleagues that are here and guests for allowing me to present this material to you uh, today. I know we have certain time constraints, uh, so I'll, we will do my, my very best to stay within those time constraints. Uh, I've already submitted a, um, a written document which I will read uh, to the committee, and I've also submitted to you some uh, paperwork which is uh, of a scientific nature of our findings. But I have not uh, stated anything of my own personal background, so I'd like to take uh, a very short period of time to do that. Uh, I have a, a degree as a Bachelor of Science, uh, Doctor of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, I did uh, research with uh, Dow Corning for a bone replacement uh, implants, uh, then participated in research in tendon regeneration. I have a good uh, knowledge of uh, the biological workings of the human body. Uh, I was also, uh, for uh, three years, uh, the uh, chairman of a committee at the Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in Hollywood, California, head of the diabetic clinic, and director of residency training program at a hospital in Simi Valley, California. Uh, if anyone had told me uh, at that time that I would be involved in uh, anything in the UFO field or traveled to uh, 42 countries and uh, participated uh, in the things that I have participated in relative to UFOs, I would have said, they're nuts. Uh, uh, strange things have happened in my life that were very uh, synchronistic. Uh, one of these uh, was uh, my cousin's uh, occupation as a, a PhD psychology uh, professor at the University of Connecticut who uh, wrote a series of books on the near-death experience. One of the books he wrote was called The Omega Project and it was uh, funded by the University of Connecticut. But the interesting thing was that the story uh, that he was trying to uh, portray or the research project itself was to look for a common psychological profile between those who had UFO experiences and those that had near-death experiences. The end result was there wasn't any. It was a totally, entirely different subject. Uh, at that time, I was just getting into, uh, into the field, and he asked me if I would uh, like to have his uh, research material because he no longer was going to be doing anything with UFOs. I accepted and expected to get a little package. I got boxes and boxes and boxes of material, research work, and books from uh, uh, some of the best known authors in the field of ufology. Now, it's a two-way street. I came here not only to present information, but also to learn information. For example, I was very interested to learn that the uh, Eisenhower speech not only talked about the military industrial complex, but the military industrial congressional complex. I thought that was very informative. I also thought that we thought it was very informative to learn that the oaths that were taken by military officers and other officers in government was to the Constitution of the United States and not to any particular committee or policy. So I am here also as a student to learn from you. Uh, what I've uh, planned uh, today and ask you that favor, again with time constraints, is that uh, at the end of my presentation, I'm allowed to ask you just two questions which may be answered by any one of you that would like to take the challenge of answering it. We'll be willing uh, to suspend to do that. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Now I'd uh, like to uh, read the uh, written presentation that I prepared and submitted uh, to the committee. Uh, I, with my surgical team of uh, medical specialists, uh, performed 16 surgeries for the removal of foreign objects from those individuals who allege alien abduction. The 16 cases involved removal of 17 separate and distinct objects. 
One of these objects turned out to be a small run of ceramic-like glass, which was manufactured by Dow Corning Industries. In almost my 50 years of podiatric surgical practice, I have removed literally hundreds or numerous, uh, numerous objects from the human foot, including paper, gla glass, metal, uh, stones, hair, coral, and many other objects, including secret metal. Uh, at one time, a patient came in with uh, two gentlemen in suits and the proper identification. Uh, he worked as a machinist uh, for an aerospace company. Uh, I removed the object and they said, please. And so I handed them the material that I removed from the individual's foot. Later come to find out that it was a new material that was experimental for the use of rocket valves and rocketry. Uh, the individuals involved in this study all presented with uh, no noted portal of entry for any of the objects that were removed. There was uh, no visible scar formation and there was no interruption of the integrity of the skin, even when examination was performed with a magnifying loop, not only examining the area involved, but a large amount of the peripheral area. All the individuals in the study presented with positive x-rays or CT scans showing metallic or lesser dense foreign objects. Prior to the surgical procedures performed, the areas of interest were examined by the use of a Gauss meter for magnetic or electromagnetic emissions. 10 of them were found to be producing readings on a Gauss meter of six to 10 milligauss. That is a large amount for a very small object that varies in size from approximately six to 10 millimeters in length and about the diameter of a pencil head. Now I understand that uh, from uh, the crew here and some of the television people I've worked with that a modern television camera produces about 4.3 milligauss of emissions. So here is a very small object producing 10 milligauss of emissions. Now, um, we, in addition to uh, these uh, type of examinations, we used uh, frequencies of uh, ultraviolet light to uh, detect fluorescence in the area of the object. About 60% presented with positive UV light fluorescence with color ranges from pink, green, to yellow. One of the last surgical patients displayed a large chevron appearing area uh, like an insignia on the outside of the right arm near the shoulder. He had no prior knowledge of it being there. We have also found that the removal of this fluorescent material with ordinary solvents only makes them disappear for intervals of approximately one hour. But when re-examined again, they appear again with the use of ultraviolet light with varying frequencies. In addition, by use of radio wave frequency detector, we were able to detect that certain radio frequencies in the FM band, both in the megahertz and kilohertz range, were being emitted from the object. It was determined that in one case, the frequencies detected, and this is through a chart that I was able to obtain through um, sources that I will not be able to mention, but these frequencies were noted fixed or mobile deep space frequencies. Unfortunately, our limited budget for performing this research has not allowed us to obtain a radio frequency analyzer so that a radio wave could be captured and analyzed. All Doc surgeries Doctor, were you have performed. About one minute. I just wanted to make you aware of that, so you could. You got about one minute. Yes, sir. All the surgeries we performed were, were documented with eyewitnesses, video, and still photography. We established a chain of criteria and protocols for a forensic chain of custody. All the objects were placed in sterile containers using the patient's own blood serum. These containers are then uh, signed and not opened again until they reach the laboratories. I will skip some of the material because of time constraints. We find that in all pathological reports, there is no inflammatory reaction. There is no rejection reaction. There is no an exhaustive research of human science. There is nothing that we have found in material science that will produce absolutely no inflammatory reaction in the human body. 
<laughs> these objects all do. Also, in addition, they are surrounded by a large amount of specialized nerve endings called proprioceptors, and in these are areas which are not consistent with Gray's anatomy. The pathology reports and examination we have sent to material science laboratories. Some of these include Los Alamos National Laboratories, New Mexico Tech, University of California at San Diego, Southwest Laboratories in San Antonio, Texas, as well as numerous other laboratories outside the country. ANA's research, research scientists and our science board has enabled us to do some of our own scientific studies. I've already described some of the length and size of the objects. So Doctor, we'll I absolutely that. hate to do this, but your time has expired. And <clears throat> uh, what we're going to do, though, is suspend and allow you your request. And I would ask the members of the panel to, uh, to keep their answers, not questions, their answers here, as short as possible so that we can at least get five minutes for our questioning of this technology panel that I'm, how often do you get to hear from four PhD physicists, scientists, everything else? So I uh, want to have plenty of time for our questions, but go ahead. You want me to be finished? You, no, have, no, no, I want you to ask the question okay. you asked me to sure. change the rules in order okay. to ask. <laughs> what I'd like to ask you, uh, number one, is uh, do you uh, in your present positions, being retired uh, Congress people, Senator, uh, do you consider the United States to be a world superpower? Anybody that wishes to answer that? In terms of uh, military uh, capability and force, yes. In terms of intellectual capacity and moral guidance, no. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Kirkpatrick, would you like to add I, anything? I concur with the senator, exactly. Thank you. Now, well, uh, this will be very short. Uh, let's assume that what we learned from them up there, let's just assume hypothetically that this is a reality. What kind of a position would you think that the United States would be on a world scale if a third world country, a renegade country, would release the entire amount of information to the public of the world? It couldn't do anything. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things we hope, that if the uh, issue is brought before the General Assembly and is voted to hold a global conference, then uh, that conference will be its own guide regardless of the United States of America or Britain or any other country uh, because it will be beyond their control. And that's one of the reasons why I personally would like this issue to go before the General Assembly and not uh, go before the Congress, which I think will just continue the cover-up that we've experienced from the government for the last 50 years. I would say that there's probably not a person in this room that would not agree with you. Oh, no, there's no, I think there's a question. That, uh, that is, is not totally true, what you just said. But um, <clears throat> I, I do believe that it would make a huge huge difference. I actually think it would make uh, the people of the world, certainly the people of the United States, uh, even better. I think if we had absolute knowledge of these things, uh, peace would be more likely, a unified uh, approach towards really finding out answers of other things to eliminate suffering and disease and everything else would be vastly enhanced. I think there's a lot of wonderful good. Uh, I don't necessarily think the United States would slip into second place on anything. I am uh, have a little bit of difference with my Esteemed colleague from uh, Alaska on that. I've got to say, I'm impressed with the credentials of the people we've heard from, uh, people with doctor's degrees in medicine, and uh, we have, in other words, two that are clearly at the highest uh, levels of biological science, if they're medical degrees, which I assume Dr. Lear and Dr. Greer have, and I think 
Dr. Vallon, I think you're a physicist, as is Dr. Wood, and uh, in the physical area. So we've got the, this is a unique opportunity to hear from physical and biological scientists of, uh, of great stature and uh, qualification. So I'm going to ask Dr. Wood a question that I started to ask the other panel, which I wouldn't have asked if I'd known this panel was this <laughs> qualified in the area. One of the biggest uh, uh, concerns of people, uh, that, that one of the biggest reasons why people <clears throat> don't believe that UFOs have extraterrestrial origins is this whole question of the speed of light. I'm going to ask Robert Wood, how, how old or large do you think the universe is? Well, and you're a physicist. You probably yeah. thought about these things. I think the latest estimate is 20 billion years. Okay. Uh, about how large is the Milky Way galaxy, which is just a very tiny little, little part of the I think the universe. diameter is about 50,000 light years. Uh, it's a 100,000 okay. light years across. Yeah. And, and the, yeah, it used to be, in the books at that time it was 50, it's today, it's considered to be about 100,000 with the... So if we only went 10, uh, tell me if I'm right about this. If we were only able to send craft at one-tenth the speed of light, if the universe is 15 or 20 billion years old, which I think you've said you think, couldn't a spacecraft go from one end of a 100,000 light year galaxy to the other end of that galaxy in a period of the time of the, this universe has been in existence, 15,000 different times and go back and forth? In other words, why is the speed of light such a big problem? That's what I'm trying to understand. No. Well, I'm not I, trying to say it stops the idea. I'm saying, am I right that it, a, a craft could go 15,000 times from one end of the galaxy to the other in, in the amount of time it's, it's happened? We think in terms of our own time. But I'd just like you to respond to that. Well, I, I'd like to answer that in two parts. The first part has to do with the organizational name we are working with, Paradigm Research Group. And the idea of paradigm is that the concepts of science get changed suddenly. Sure. And mm -hmm. Newton had a mm -hmm. paradigm of F equals MA. And Einstein came along and said, no, that's quite, not quite right. When you go close to the speed of light, you've got different equations. Sure. Sure. And so the old paradigm was overthrown. My thought here is that the current paradigm that we have, that you can't travel faster than the speed of light, is it might be overthrown by what Dr. Greer had said earlier. Sure. Namely, there's a difference between inertial mass but, but, and, but it wouldn't be true then that if we, if we could go the speed of light, it wouldn't be just 15,000 times doing that. We could do that 150,000 times. In other words, right. speed of light isn't really the, a barrier to the speed interstellar light, travel, it, it, is it? In, in my opinion, the speed of light is not a barrier at all. Okay, that's what I wanted to well, establish. Can I down. comment on this yeah, just please. for a moment? Because uh, one of the areas that, that it, I don't know how much has been talked uh, about prior to today is the whole area of trans-dimensional physics. Well, so yeah. if you're dealing with three-dimensional right. space or four-dimensional space-time, you have one set of equations. But when you deal with very high-voltage systems that cause an alteration in what's called the spin, spin theory, mass, and also inertia, you have another whole set of equations which have not been disclosed yet that then become operative so that you can go from here to the end of our galaxy and back controlling for time on Earth right now in a matter of perhaps minutes or days. Okay, and I don't, and this I, is, I don't gets, question what this you're saying. Gets I'm going to yeah. uh, reclaim the time just to, to say this. Uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I can believe that we do have, uh, yeah, wormholes may well be true and so forth. But what I'm trying to say is that the wormhole theories have not been established anywhere near as established as the, uh, the speed of light and the first uh, relativity theory of Einstein have been established. So what I'm trying to say is we don't have to establish, or I'm trying to ask you, we don't necessarily have to establish some of these physicists, which may well be true, that could be established into the future, in which there are some interesting indications from the, even the past that might be happening. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yeah, so I'd like to yeah. add, uh, so, so, so will you too. respond to that, Dr. Yeah, uh, we run a conference on future energy almost every year now. It'll be one in July at the University of Maryland again. We've had David Fronig there several times as speaker. Uh, he's a professor from the University of Adelaide in Australia, and he particularly has worked on this. He actually has simulations of, um, of one times the speed light, five times, and so forth. He treats it just like the sound barrier. And he literally has uh, equation comparisons for the speed of sound, speed of light, and so forth. So my uh, emphasis is trying to make it simple. And that is the uh, inertial mass is the key to understanding how this is possible. And the special relativity equations, which I'm very familiar with, only deal with inertial mass. So yeah, if I could recognize reclaim what, my time really quickly. Yeah. And, and if so we, we start talking about artificial intelligence being involved in the control of certain vehicles as opposed to natural intelligence being in control, couldn't we also overcome some of these barriers that people have been talking about? I mean, we artificial send artificial intelligence, intelligence today Sorry, out into space. Much. Is that a possible? Well, the, adva the, the advanced extraterrestrial technologies do deal with uh, technologies that cross into the qu see, conscious uh, quantum hologram and directed I, thought. I, I got to be this clear. Is I hate to amazing. cut you off. My time has <laughs> yeah. expired. I can't violate what I'm making everybody else yeah. live by. But uh, we will now go to uh, to uh, Congresswoman Woolsey. Okay. Uh, the yeah, first to... thing I want to do is thank you all for uh, adding an even deeper level of credibility to this uh, hearing that we've had this week. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the subject of ufology is so out there that we have to, many of us have to just know that because of who you are, what we're doing uh, is the, what we should be doing. So, but speaking of what we should be doing, my question to each of you to answer uh, in the time we have uh, is where do you believe that the United States ranks in preparation to meet the, the global needs for the future? And uh, where will the brilliant students that will become adults like yourselves, only some of them have to be women, uh, come from to meet the numbers we're going to need? Well, when you asked the question, my immediate reaction was when you said the United States, yeah. I Which asked part? myself who's really in charge That's of the right. answer to your question. That's a good question. And so I, I think the issue which we're dealing with is, is a truth embargo issue and, and this enormous secrecy which controls and dominates our entire process, maybe even including the educational process. But if you talk about the ordinary world that we mostly, most of us think that we, we live in, uh, cl clearly we, we need to establish the, the, the ideas that new ideas, as uh, n the discoveries, as Stan Friedman said, come from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. So I think we need to emphasize the importance of creativity in developing the next set of equations that we need and may have already been discovered, but we need to, to make our society better and stronger. Thank you. Steve. Well, I think we already have everything we need to create a sustainable, uh, poverty-free world. It's already extant, and this is very good news. The very bad news is that there is a ruthless, deep national security state that the people I have worked with have run into that is this massive buzzsaw. And I think that at a certain point, we the people and the Congress and the United Nations and other countries have to come together and say, we've had enough of this nonsense. And I, I do not think this is gonna come from an executive order from the president. I think it's going to come from people stepping forward. And I wish to emphasize that, as I did the other day, that in 1998, we declared these unacknowledged special access projects unconstitutional, a priori illegal. And we encouraged, and we now have over 500 people who have come forward to give us information, documents, and what have you on this. And I think we need to continue to do that. I think we have to say to people who are really not responsive to the people that this is still a world of liberty, and we have to be free to know the truth. Thank you. Yeah. Very good.
Dr. Vallone. Could I show uh, slide 23, please, as I'm talking? Um, what I'd like to explain is that I agree with our um, co-panelists, and that is the United States already has these this technology, and I had the privilege of talking with a former Black Project engineer. I uh, spent the whole afternoon with him taking pages and pages of notes, one of which is actually in front of me right here. And what I learned is, first of all, he taught me all the details of creating an electrogravitic layered um, uh, semiconductor that with bismuth in between and magnesium and zinc with the same percentages that when slide 23 pops up, you'll see that was published years before in a um, co uh, colleague's book called uh, uh, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion. And uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Violet only let me know uh, a year later, uh, he said, oh, this sounds like what I learned from another black project engineer who actually was through Aviation Weekly uh, over in England. So this is very interesting because my contact told me so many things I couldn't believe, I just took the notes down. But after I corroborated this with Linda Moulton Hull's art artifact as well, we have three different corroborations within 1% variation of the same artifact. In fact, slide 24, if she gets that up, will also show the actual um, semiconductor. But the important part is that we have the technology, students are contacting our Integrity Research Institute all the time, saying, what should we study? And this is, I used to be a college teacher, you need to 13 chapters with questions and answers at, uh, at the end of each chapter, and the books need to be written. Uh, the Zero Point Energy book, the Electrobitics mm -hmm. book, these the textbooks are the textbooks of the future, and the students are already there the waiting to study this stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is the book I'm talking about, and if we progress to the next slide, um, we'll see the actual uh, page that Paul was talking about. And this, to me, was amazing synchronicity. So I started to believe the other stuff that this Black Project fellow told me, and that is we already have a, a base on Mars, which was established in the 1970s, and I said, oh, I don't believe that. He says, Oh, go, go check the NASA records of the greenhouse gases from Mars' atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They increased in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that was his counter, uh, counterpoint and, uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. He says we have a deep space platform. He even gave me a jaw dropper, and that was the Gulf Breeze UFO conferences that almost amazingly always had a UFO sighting during the conference. He says, I know the guy who ran the craft. It was a back engineered craft, and he just did it for fun, fly over mm -hmm. the UFO conference and create some, some stir. Hmm. So um, this is the kind of problem we have. All right, thank These you. boys with toys. Thank you, Dr. Lair. <laughs> I have uh, a different uh, approach. Okay. I'm very pessimistic. I believe that the knowledge, the basic knowledge of all this having to do with the, we've been using the term extraterrestriality as a more general term than it should be used, because we really don't understand the entire ramifications of the universe itself. We don't know whether this is a multiverse, <coughs> whether there are various time uh, areas involved, <laughs> but someone does know. And I believe that at one time, at the days of Majestic 12 and Eisenhower and Truman and so on, and the state that the world was in, it was necessary to keep this a secret from the public. <coughs> but now I believe, uh, again, I'm sorry to be pessimistic, I believe this has moved on from governments, the United States government or any other government, into the hands of a greedy industrial complex the, that uh, does not want it to change. Time has expired. Thank you very so, much. So now go to... And I'll go to Representative Barton. Thank you very much. Because I want our deliberations to be most favorably uh, uh, perceived, uh, I have one little question I'd like to get cleared up. I understand that uh, a bit ago there was a petition being circulated in one of our communities suggesting that the city water work should stop putting dihydrooxide into the water system because if in the future it was determined to be hazardous to health, it could never be removed. Dihydrooxide, of course, is water. And it's true that if you put it in there, it can never be removed. My question has to do with a comment that was made uh, both yesterday and the day before, that uh, we're looking at getting energy from water. Now, I'd always <coughs> thought of water as the ash you get when you burn 
hydrogen. So I'm wondering, what am I missing here? Unless you're talking about nuclear energy, I'm having some trouble understanding how you get chemical energy from an ash. Yes, well, Can you help clear this up for the record? I can, and we did a great deal of research on this and actually have a proposal that I've given to the chairman uh, for you to look at. Uh, Stan Meyer and other people have found that using very high voltage systems at certain resonant frequencies causes a recruitment of energy from the ambient zero point energy field that was spoken about so that you can break the hydrogen oxygen bond so you have two gases that you can burn and when you burn it the only effluent is water vapor because it recombines now this is actually was done uh, and and it was operational unfortunately Stan Meyer died under mysterious conditions and he took those secrets to his grave his twin brother is still living and people who work with him are still living there are a number of them want to work with us in an R&D project to do this so we convert the internal combustion engines we have now to water engines. And this is not a, a pipe dream. This is actually something that can be okay. done. So well, My but what next question, sir, yeah. then, I can believe that they did this. But unless they're violating the second law of thermodynamics, which I don't think we think is that no, they're not. violate, there's going to be less energy come out than you put into splitting the No, that's the, whole point, that's the whole point of what's called an over-unity system. Maybe this didn't get covered, is that you're setting up an electromagnetic pointing vector. And we can into, violate the second law of thermodynamics. No, no sir, no. Because what the, the, it, no, there's constant conservation of energy, but there's another energy field that hasn't been accounted for. Okay. Called, and some call it, may call it the okay. Higgs field Thank now. you for getting this in the so, record. So there is absolutely no violation we of the gullible. second law of thermodynamics, none at all. And that's a very important thing to understand. You're actually taking energy. It's been estimated that every cubic centimeter of space in this room has enough energy to run the earth for a day if you could tap it properly through these systems. So that means it, the energy is there, but you have to be able to create a vector into that energy field. The zero-point energy field he's talking about. Yeah. The, the quantum vacuum, in other words. Quantum vacuum, yeah. Okay. I just want this cleared up because I think many people understand chemistry as I do, that water is the ash you get when you burn hydrogen, and it's hard to get energy out of ashes. So thank you yeah. for, for, for clearing that up. I think that... Uh, there's a general consensus that if these uh, UFOs are real and if they're extraterrestrial, that they somehow have learned to do what we would love to be able to do, and that is um, have an anti-gravity thing. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much we know by reverse engineering these things, uh, wow. how much we know about that. But whatever we know about it, do you think that information is being made available to um, Stephen Hawking? I haven't heard he died, so I guess he's still alive, and people like him who are trying to harmonize the mysteries of the universe, uh, relativity and gravity and so forth. Do you think it's being, I hope it's being made available to them. You think not? <laughs> If you're talking about black project discoveries from back engineering, no, I'm sorry. It's the same as in the government. Uh, they're all in the dark. And, and they literally are opposed to anything that would violate their little classical laws of physics that they're used to. I, I know I've dealt with professors uh, all my life. And unfortunately, it's a big dichotomy between the ivory towers that they sit in and the Black Project guys that say, hey, the laws of physics need to be rewritten. And, and that exact quote has been used many times for those investigating the, the black, uh, and black world, it's literally called. It's not just the laws of physics that have to be rewritten, the laws of physiology have to be rewritten. Because well, if, there are people, in, if, there, if there are entities yeah. uh, in these um, uh, craft, the maneuver, maneuvers they make, we couldn't survive it. Yes, we can. That's what I tried to explain in my slideshow. I'd be glad to pull up um, slide 18 again and slide 17. Um, this is a very important discovery that's been made, and I've, I'm one of the few that have put these things together to describe 17, which is the inertial uh, inertia. In other words, inertial mass is now known to be a zero-point energy effect. Right. And, and the slide you're looking at right here is slide 18. That's the conclusion of that. The previous one, 17, is the journal article that is probably front page news and should be. Because once inertia now is discovered to be an electromagnetic phenomenon, that's, um, uh, that's an exact uh, breakthrough, in other words. And if we go back one slide, the journal article obviously is something we need to refer to because uh, Hal Putoff was responsible for that. Bernie Hayes, who I know personally, was also responsible. And they proved it. They literally did uh, stochastic electrodynamics to conclude that it's simply a Lorentz force, F equals V cross B. And if you know what I'm talking about, V cross B, vo velocity crossing with a magnetic field gives you a force. 
and you see that in electromagnetism, but who would know you could see that in a movement of a vehicle? And, but you do. In other words, you're moving to the right, you want to turn to the right, and your body is going to the left. That's the Lorentz force. That's exactly what you see in electromagnetism, and now we find that it's in vehicular movement as well. So therefore, this is an interaction between the zero-point field, which is all around us, and the individual electromagnetism of your body, of the craft. And exactly that means shielding is possible. And, and uh, once the shielding is possible, you've got all kinds of My time has expired. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I would like to go to our new questioner, uh, Dr. Bookman, who, by the way, ran for Congress from my state not too many years ago, five or six years ago, I believe. Not against Merrill, though, uh, against <laughs> your colleague, Rob Bishop. Um, Dr. Greer, you mentioned 25-mile-wide craft. 26. 26-mile-wide yeah. craft, and you mentioned that uh, you believe the military-industrial complex has a program of shooting them down. Have we shot down one that big, in your opinion, or no, from your I, witnesses? To my knowledge, those have not been uh, uh, targeted. We do have witnesses, uh, and there is a, a number of testimonies from pilots where attempts to target and bring them down have occurred. And I think that we have to understand that $2.3 trillion in unaccounted funds in the military-industrial complex have resulted in some very strange things going on. I call it this strange Lovian complex, where there are folks who are doing things without proper oversight from the Congress or the President that are really a threat to our national security. The briefing I did for the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, General Patrick Hughes, really focused on this, and I have never spoken of this publicly until now. But the big concern was is that there was a cabal or a deep national security operation of which he knew nothing and did not control that was doing some rather dangerous things that could uh, endanger not only our nation, but the world. And I think this is an existential threat to not only world peace, and I think we have to start thinking not just of world peace, but of interplanetary relations and universal peace. But to get more specific, there are portable EMP, electromagnetic pulse systems, and others that involve scalar or longitudinal waves that are, as opposed to a light wave that moves like this, are longitudinal, that have been weaponized. And as uh, Werner von Braun uh, uh, stated in the last years of his life through our Disclosure Project witness, Carol Rosen, that uh, these sort of technologies are being deployed in the space and should not be. Uh, moreover, there's a number of false flag operations that have happened, as was referred to in Gulf Breeze, where there have been objects that appear to be ET that aren't, and contact events that appear to be alien that aren't. And these include uh, the manufacture at EGNG near the Nellis range of a number of implants. Uh, as you know from our witness, uh, Mr. Powlick, who worked with the CIA, they were manufacturing up to two billion of these in the 70s and 80s. This interview is on YouTube. There's a number of things I have not had time to go into that I really do believe are an existential threat to our planet. And I wish I, we had time to go into the, them yes, now. Right. Yeah. We, maybe on the too. break, maybe people can read up on this too. Yes. If I'm doing my dual job correctly, I have about three minutes left. Yes, so sir. somebody time me and cut me off or I'll go forever. Thank you for that. If I understand correctly, Linda Moulton Howe, George Knapp, Dolan, yourself, have had conversations with people deep in the military industrial complex who've told you things off the record, privately. It would make a great movie, I gather. By the way, Disclosure, uh, the serious movie is a, is a great movie as well. Thank you. If the United States Congress, or what would, what would you need, what, what do you feel they would need from the United States Congress in order to be able to feel safe testifying on 60 Minutes or somewhere? I mean. Right. I appreciate your point, Dr. Lear, and others have made this, that we have an oath to the Constitution, not to some independent agency that's gotten out of Correct. control. Correct. What would it take for those people to be free to their secrecy oaths such that they could appear in the media publicly on these issues? Well, I think the question is, would the media even allow it? As I mentioned, uh, when ABC News wanted to do this with 35 digital hours of top secret testimony, uh, Ira Rosen was shot down by corporate ABC. That's one question. The other question becomes, uh, I think some of these people, and, and the, the briefing I put together for the president that went to, to him via uh, John Podesta, Center of American Progress, uh, 
was oriented towards getting those executive actions done because we need federal marshal protection for some of these people. I know who they are. I'm holding their documents. It's part of, I hate to say this, my part of my dead man trigger. If anything happens to me, it'll hit the internet. Um, I'm probably more valuable alive than dead. I uh, hope to, you stay that keep, way. Well, well <laughs> from the point of view of, of, of keeping the secrecy there. But I'm not going to violate people's confidentialities. What I will say is that there's an enormous amount of actionable intelligence we have and names that can be provided, including members of this majestic committee with whom I've met. And many of them would like to see this information come out. The problem is lethal force has been threatened and well, used. And, well, and I think that this has become something that needs a, an FBI investigation, congressional investigation, and, and subpoenas. I, I have and, one minute and, left if I've timed yeah, myself yeah. correctly here. I'll, I'll do this. Uh, yeah, so. Yes, sir. It, it, are you saying there's nothing Congress could do to pass legislation? When I ran for Congress, I called for legislation protecting whistleblowers. The last, this administration has been prosecuting whistleblowers like crazy. Right. And I said, we need to protect whistleblowers on waste, fraud, criminal activity, and the UFO issue. And all the media focused on in my campaign was ridiculing me over UFOs. Thank you, media. Is, is there anything Congress could do such that those people would feel safe? Yes, and they, can, is, they can issue yeah. subpoenas, and they can also require the uh, Federal Marshal Protective Services to protect them, and they would be. And I think that this is something that can be done if there was the will and the intent within the Congress. Barring that, I think we've brought out as many people as we can. One of my frustrations is knowing too many people and having too much information that I can't give actionable intelligence on to the general public without violating, I, I take this like a doctor with patient confidentiality without protecting those people's confidentiality, well, I, I, but we I, have this information. I would love to be subpoenaed so I could give it over to a proper I've heard that authority. from George Knapp and, and others as well. You're not alone in that. There right. are a lot of witnesses that if yes. protected would come out. And with that, I see my time is up. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berkman. We'll now go to uh, Senator Gravel. I uh, am not qualified to get into the technical discussion, but uh, I would say this. Uh, Dr. Wood referred to, you know, if the black area has this knowledge, uh, you've pointed out that uh, whoever was the head of the CIA at the time uh, you know, shut shut the door on, and and I would uh, and Dr. Vallone, uh we've heard testimony before about the uh, uh, the fact that somebody was boasting from one of these black areas, which is the, these contractors, that we have the capability to take ET back home. Uh, is that? something briefly that so squares with your knowledge at this point in time? Absolutely. That's a quote from the former CEO of uh, Lockheed, I believe. Yes, yeah. Ben Rich. Ben Rich. So uh, it's a famous quote, well, and, then, and it's true. But, and it's, okay, but I if, would agree with it. if you think that's believable, and that's a quote from the head of a, of a corporation, you know, this is criminal. This, because we go back to uh, what Dr. Greer was saying, that you know we have the capability of, of sharing this technology and freeing up the world to an unbelievable level. Yeah. So, so, so we, you know, we stand capable of indicting in the, in the area of public opinion the head of what, Lockheed? Yes. Well, that's right, Skunk Works. And he, he knew what he was talking about because he had all the That's fine. I'll accept that he knows what he's on. talking about. He's depriving the world <laughs> yeah, of a possible advancement. <laughs> yep. Here, you, all, all of you, all four of you, you interface with scientists in the whole black area. You know, you're, t you're trying to talk, you're talking. Where's their moral content? Well, I can answer that if you... Where is it? They've got tight. a hole somewhere. Ben Rich wrote a book, and he specifically described the sundown rule. And I wrote about it, it's on our website, it's one of the recommendations we have, the sundown rule should be enforced. And that is, classified, fine, how many years? You have to put a time limit on every classified document. And therefore, it's, it's going down, the sun's going down in 10 years, and it becomes free. 
and the yeah. public gets access to it. Well, the, right now, the, we have about 50 fine. years. Well, I've got to tell you, the Congress has tried to put that kind of a rule in on the laws, and it's be, never worked. I know. So well, this is why good I luck think in your at least field. one solution. Well, and this is why I think in the tradition of, of, of Martin Luther King, in the tradition of Susan B. Anthony, in the tradition of Thomas Jefferson, we should say the hell with these games. People who know this, I believe, as you said, have a moral obligation to our children and our grandchildren to step forward with the truth, with the technology, and with the information, because there is a criminal national security deep state that has basically thumbed its nose at the Constitution. And for that reason, there is no, no uh, justification for the continued secrecy. Uh, and I think that one of the things uh, all of us as citizens have to decide is whether we're going to do that or not. Could it be risky? Yes. Do we have to make sacrifices? Yes. Uh, but you know, part of it gets, gets into the, every, everybody puts their, their pants on one leg at a time. I was talking to the deputy director of the National Science Foundation, and I turned to him and I said, we really need your help getting this information, this technology out. He says, yes, I'd love to, but it'd be the end of my career. And I said, okay, on one hand, we have the fate of the future of humanity. On the other hand, we have your career. Your selfish and so, okay. career. Your selfish <laughs> career. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw your film the other night. I want to compliment you on it. I just I thought that was awesome. But uh, but let me just uh, I think I said it er in an earlier day. You know nobody questions authority anymore. The whole population is gutless, and and we and we we beat our we pat ourselves on the back that that we're so wonderful. We're the leaders of the world. My God, we are stifling the ability of the world to go forward. And, and, uh, and we've, we put that aside because, oh, we're questioning our patriotism. Well, we need to question our patriotism. We need to, I want to give one example. When the Pentagon Papers was sent over to the House and the Senate, they were put under guard and a member could only go in and read them and couldn't take any notes. That, and I was 42 years old. When I was 23 years old, I could classify top secret documents. Are we not? At a, at, a, at a situation where it's absolutely ridiculous. And then after they were released, yes. it was moot. The Supreme Court was made moot, the Congress was made moot, and, and the decision was made that any member of Congress can release any information of all these secrets, and it hasn't happened since 1972. So the indictment is on us as a Congress, and that's the reason why when the whole purpose of this hearing was, we'll take this to Congress and have another hearing. Boy, that's just taking the issue and putting it on a shelf forever. Mm -hmm. And it just won't happen. <laughs> yeah, I'll yield, I'll yield for a question or a statement. Well, I just wanted to say the sunset rules sunset. actually are in effect. Uh, uh, the sunset. Brady gun laws sunsetted after five years and uh, they it was, was no, and then, and then it wasn't <laughs> continued. I mean, we never went back and visited it. So it's there when, and it depends so on who's the issue, that. and it depends on who's the le in the leadership. If there's, yeah, but well, here, the, sunset, the sunset principle is, is sundown Congress rules, has yeah. the ability to go back and see anything. We have an oversight capacity. If there's one activity in the Congress that's not dealt with properly is our oversight capacity. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, and in fact, when I've met with over, oversight Chair, for example, Congressman Dan Burton, members of the Senate Intelligence Committee who were in office, uh, they were very interested. But what I have found, there's a disconnect between what people want to know and what people want to do. There's a fear of touching this subject because of the ridicule factor and other reasons. And I think we just have to become more courageous. Well, and also know what you want to ask for for declassification. Uh, uh, I'd like to meet with you later, anyways. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that could I mention inspired? there's an Office of Declassification in College Park, Maryland? That's where the official federal government Office of Declassification is. It's solicitable, you can approach them, and if you know what to ask for, that's the key, then you can ask for it to be declassified. Your, your time has not quite expired. Not unless, expired. Oh, well, I see the sign right there, right. it's already oh, stopped. Oh, it just it expired. expired. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. That's why I stopped. You used to have my time asking questions <laughs> Now we'll go to uh, Representative Kilpatrick. Now I'm, I'm questioning now, right? Yes, you're questioning okay. now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Excellent panel. Excellent, way over my head. 
I did see Sirius the other night, which was also way over my head, but I got parts of it. And the whole week has helped me get more and more. But your sitting here today brings back for me the validity, the intelligence, and the necessity of moving forward with this incident. It's just, you gotta have to do it. And you all have provided, without even saying it as an introduction, the technology that exists in the world that we don't now yet display that we have. We may have it, I don't know. We don't display that we do. It's a real critical concern to our national security and to other things, so I wanna commend you for that. I think that's, that's excellent. Uh, Dr. Lear, I wanna to go to you. You talked about removing 16 objects from people. I think in my reading and preparation, that was called implantation, and I might have that wrong. Is that the right word? That is absolutely correct. Oh, good. Okay, hey. I'm learning something here. Okay, then, when you, and it also is related to people who have been implanted with something, and you described that it was a uh, different kind of material that didn't meet the usual, which means to me it came from somewhere else. Is that correct? That's correct. I submitted uh, to the committee a set of scientific documents uh, that shows some of the latest work and uh, findings that we find in the material science of these objects. But I want to point out, too, that to my shock, absolute shock, was a paper that was uh, given to me through the Freedom of Information Act in which it describes all my work in the OSTP in the White House given to President Obama at the time he was trying to raise money for the medical care bill. And the individual that wrote the article stated that if my work was not correct, or the work done by my team was not correct, and that it was secret work that was done by some governmental agency, this also should be released to the public because it would save billions of dollars in health care. And what is the implication? Break that down for me, please. Well, if we took just the fact that there is no inflammatory response of these objects and no rejection of these objects, you can see that you could take anything that we use medically, a pin, a screw, a nail, a heart, a kidney, any organ, place it into the body, the body would not reject it, and the individual would not have to be on very expensive uh, anti-rejection medication for the rest of their lives. Now, that has nothing to do at all with the material science associated with these objects that we have found here. Well, this is a very advanced nanotechnology. These are nanotechnological devices in which nanocarbon tubes, either single or double wall, I won't go into the whole explanation, but they can be elongated and weaved into carbon nanofibers, carbon nanostrands, and they end in crystalline structures, which are what we call orthorhombic, which are regular rectangular structures. And we have to remember that in the early days when I was a child, and radio, and you got a crystal set with a battery and an earphone, and you were able to get a radio station. That was a marvel. So here's a very, very advanced nano, when I say nanotechnological, I'm talking about things that are on a level of the size of an atom, using the principal elements of certain materials, putting them together in such a way so that you're actually broadcasting or switching what we perceive as a radio wave, which may not be a radio wave. It could be scalar technology, which when it reaches our electromagnetic spectrum, is converted to a radio wave harmonic, which I know is a little bit complex. But it is sending information to somebody. So somebody out there is listening to something going on in our bodies. Now we know that even John Glenn, when he went into space originally, complained on public television that he had to swallow implants because this was vital information needed on the physiology of the body to know what was going on in space. Okay. And so therefore your conclusion, you and your team, as it relates to health care, as it relates to our country, as it relates to our budget, and to our phenomenon topic we've been talking about today. What do you conclude? 
Well, I conclude that if there was funding, at least funding, or uh, open-mindedness from the scientific community, which there is not, because they also pray to hire masters. They don't want to lose their jobs. They have families to feed. They don't want to look at this stuff in the way that we've looked at it for the benefit of mankind. Thank you very much. If, if we can bring up slide 25, I would like to show 25, 26, and 27 very quickly, and that is scalar waves are hugely important because what Dr. Lear just mentioned is a big, um, uh, another um, overcoming of the sputolite problem with electromagnetic waves traveling so slow, there's no communication possible across the Milky Way. Well, it turns out there is, and this is a proof of it, the Chilbolton crop circle. Based on the Arecibo message that was sent out in 1974, we all of a sudden have this amazing phenomenon that shows a scalar uh, generator antenna right at the bottom of the, um, uh, of the diagram that copies. This diagram actually is the original one that was sent out in 1974 from Arecibo. It's a digital message that was sent out with the most powerful telescope available at the time, thanks to Frank Drake, SETI program. And what happened in... Um, 1990, uh, 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 I don't have the exact date here, <clears throat> 19, 2001, August 2001, uh, the next slide, there was an appearance of a crop circle overnight right next to a radio telescope in Chilbolton, England. And the amazing thing was it wasn't just a regular crop circle. This thing had almost exactly the same one-to-one -one correspondence to the Arecibo message. Uh, slide 26, please, and then slide 27. And that's exactly what the thing looked like. The crop circle is just a bunch of crops that are down or up. And then the next one is 27. And we see at the bottom of 27, instead of the Arecibo antenna, which is a parabolic dish, we're seeing something that looks like two circular objects that literally, uh, it says a change in transmitter diameter from one of the online commentaries on Joe Bolton. And the very bottom is something that describes a scalar broadcast uh, antenna that is actually the answer to instantaneous communication across the Milky Way. Enough said. This is, this is a big breakthrough. <laughs> Thank you. Now we'll, uh, and, uh, now we'll go to closing statements from Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to say thank you for the invitation. I'm certainly a much wiser, better public servant than I was before I walked through these doors. Uh, to the, my panel, my colleagues, you've been excellent. Many times we are so busy in Congress, we don't get to know each other unless we travel in what's called congressional delegations and do some work or work on the committee. You know best your committee and your caucus. And beyond that, these things help. So thank you very much. And to the staff and all of you. To the witnesses who have been with us all week, outstanding. I think it's America's loss that none of the press across this country felt the obligation to cover these hearings. The information that we've learned, that American people should also have learned, and those who streamed God bless them probably did get some of it, will make them better people as we confront the next hundred years, the next thousand years. Because I really believe, and I wasn't convinced before I came in, but we did a little two minute interview on the close of this. And what I said in mine is, I didn't know before, and I still have a lot to learn, but I'm willing to learn because it's a universal problem and I want my grandchildren and yours and our great-grandchildren to have a universe in which to operate. So on behalf of this Congresswoman, as I go about my day and catch my plane and hope it lands smoothly, doctors, that um, I can come back and be with you again. We've got a lot of work to do. But I think you educate the people from the bottom up and not from top down. It doesn't work like that. We've done it in revolutions all over this world for hundreds of years. This is a revolutionary issue, and if we're going to sustain us, ourselves as humans, just a part of the universe, we've got work to do. To all of you, and I'm looking and seeing some of you in the audience uh, as you presented to us, thank you for allowing me to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, th thank you, Congresswoman Kilpatrick. Uh, Dr. Bookman, you've got just a minute of announcements that you, before the break. Well, for, first of all, I'd like to say to the honorable representative from Michigan, uh, you, ma'am, are a hero. I was you're a hero 
just as much as any of these witnesses, when we reached out to former members of Congress, the answer from many was, well, who else is going to be on that committee with me? I'll serve, but I won't serve with so-and-so, or I want to know who else is there. You agreed to do this not knowing any of that. You stood up and said, yes, I'll do it, and opened the space for everyone else to be here. Before you leave, I wanted to share that with you. So you, ma'am, are our John Glenn. First one up to orbit the earth. Thank you. Thank you. That's all.